Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Damien Mannion. He's a vision scientist and lecturer in the School of Psychology at University of New South Wales. His primary research interest is understanding how we perceive the world, what our visual capabilities are and how they are realized in the brain. He's here today to talk about teaching, programming and undergraduate psychology. Please welcome Dr. Damien Mannion. Okay, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to come and um, talk to you about a few of the things that we've been uh, doing in the School of Psychology at UNSW to um, use Python in our research, as well as trying to uh, teach some Python programming to our undergraduate students. So what I'm gonna talk about today, first I wanna give you a bit of a, an idea about how we use programming in research in psychology, and particularly how, we use, how I use programming in my day-to-day -day research. And I'll talk about how we then want to um, um, make undergraduate students aware of some of these uh, programming concepts and how they can use them in their own um, learning through their undergraduate program. <laughs> and finally, I want to discuss a few of the, the challenges that we've had and a few of the, the ongoing challenges in implementing this um, in, within this undergraduate community. Firstly, just talking about this idea of programming in psychology research. So the first point I want to make is that psychology is actually a, a very diverse discipline. So if you haven't actually studied um, psychology at university, you might be a little bit surprised by this, but what I've got here is I've just gone to the, the web page for my uh, School of Psychology at UNSW and had a look at the areas of expertise of our faculty. And you can see that um, probably the most uh, commonly thought of um, area of psychology, this clinical psychology or psychopathology, is just one of a, of a whole, whole range of diverse specialities. So things like cognition, or behavioral neuroscience, social psychology, these all come under the banner of psychology. What I'm gonna be focusing on today is my area, which is uh, perception. So just to give you a bit of an idea of um, the sort of things I do and, and how programming uh, fits in with that, I just wanna give you a quick uh, demonstration. So here I'm just gonna run some Python code. So part of what, what I do is trying to come up with, with visual stimuli, with visual patterns that allow us to test theories about how visual processing works. So how you're able to look at patterns and, and interpret them. So what I'm showing here is just a, a, a noise pattern, and you might be able to see that in the middle here, there's a little bit of a dark region and a little bit of a light region next to it. So what I'm gonna do is make a, um, a change to this stimulus. So I'm gonna make um, one section of it move. So I just want you, want you to, to notice how making this, this small change, making one, one part move, one part stay still, how your perception of this um, image changes. Okay, so you can see when this is in motion, all of a sudden you get this pop out, this surface segregation. Now we have a background here and these two foreground surfaces. Also this whole surface here might look, it's a, look, look like it's a bit darker and this whole surface here looks like it's a bit lighter. So just to show you there's nothing magical going on here, if we pause it, this whole thing disappears. So it's something about how our visual system is able to use this information to, um, to allow our perception. So that's just one example of how I, how I use programming is to, to rapidly sort of come up with these patterns and explore their parameters. But to give a bit of a, a broader overview of how I used um, Python, for the last uh, couple of years, I've been sort of accumulating uh, code repositories. So what I did is went to uh, that whole, whole section of code and just had a bit of a look at what external packages I'm importing. So here's the, the top 10 sort of packages I use in my day-to-day -day, uh, research. So occupying the, the number one spot by a, a far distance is NumPy. So this might not be surprising, we've heard in other, other talks over the last couple of days how NumPy really is the sort of uh, standard for um, data processing in science, and that's certainly the case with my usage. 
want to introduce you to a couple of packages you might not know of. So my, my second most used package is one called PsychoPy. So this is a, a package that's specifically um, for creating these sorts of psychology experiments and displays like I just showed you. So that was actually developed in PsychoPy. So it's been around, I've been using PsychoPy for about 10 years now. So it is, it's got quite a, a bit of traction in the psychology and the vision science community. So just to give you a, a bit of a demo of PsychoPy, here's just run some code. This is a PsychoPy window here and showing a, a visual stimulus that, that we use a lot in vision science. So this is a, a grating. So to show you the, the, the code that produces that, uh, just an import of PsychoPy, we open up a window, we create a grating with a couple of parameters like orientation, we draw the grating, we flip the buffers, wait for a key press and then close the window. So you can see it's very simple to build these, um, these quite, can be quite complex uh, graphical displays using PsychoPy. So the next package I wanted to, to highlight is one called uh, Views. So I think this is a very underrated package. So for a long time I was producing my, my figures and plots for publications uh, using matplotlib, which is what most of you were probably familiar with. And I was really happy with, when I came across views because I'd always struggled a little bit with matplotlib to get it to output exactly what I wanted. But views is a package that allows you to produce really quite, quite good uh, publication quality figures. So just to give you a few examples, here are a couple of figures from, from my work. So these are all generated purely in code, uh, purely using views. So you can see you get some nice sort of sub, sub paneling and um, some nice uh, uh, features to the, to the graphs. So having uh, figures developed in code like this is particularly important for some of my work where we have uh, large amounts of data that we like to publish alongside our articles. So for things like this, um, in the whole um, experiment we would have run, I'll be producing about 400 of these figures. So obviously if you're doing this by hand or you had any sort of uh, hand manipulation as part of this, it would be very, very challenging to produce those figures correctly. But if we can do it all in code using something like views, it's not much more difficult to produce 400 than it is to produce one. Okay, so I hope you, I've given you a bit of a, a flavor of how, how I use programming um, in my, my research in psychology. So I want to go on to, well, how can we start to include some, some instruction in these sorts of concepts within our undergraduate program? I think the, the first question to ask is, well, does it actually fit in with the aims of the program? Is this something that we want undergraduate psychology students to be able to do at the end of their degree? And I think it does. So we're, we're bound by these set of uh, gradu graduate attributes uh, that are defined in this document that outline what students will be able to do at the end of a, a four-year Australian undergraduate psychology program. I think where programming really fits in best is in this graduate attribute two, an understanding of research methods in psychology. So here the graduates are able to understand, apply and evaluate basic research methods in psychology, including research design, data analysis and interpretation and the appropriate use of technologies. So I think this last point here, the appropriate use of technologies is where we can really start to build in some programming understanding, some programming knowledge in our undergraduate students. So associated with gra this graduate attribute, they also have some suggested uh, learning outcomes that might contribute to this. And at the moment, this is the, the relevant learning outcome, uh, using basic web search, word processing and so on. So I think there's considerable scope to expand this learning outcome. So I think this was drafted in 2008, and I think now we can really assume a lot of this knowledge coming in, like web search, and instead um, give students some of this understanding of programming concepts. So here I'll just start talking about a few examples of how we've begun to integrate Python into some of our undergraduate courses. So we've done this in two, two courses in particular, a third year 
third year course called Vision and Brain, and a third year course called Research Internship. So Vision and Brain is a, a third year elective course of about 50 or 60 students enrolled. And as part of the course, they do a group project. It's about two or five students uh, per group. And what they do is they have to design and implement their own vision science experiment. So they come up with an idea for a vision and science experiment. They then um, use Python, use PsychoPy to actually implement this experiment, collect some data, and then at the end of the semester, we have a, a little mini conference like shown here, where the students uh, present the results of their research to, um, to interested uh, faculty and other students. For the research internship, this is a course where, where students um, become um, attached to a, a faculty member and they do a, a, a small project with them. Over the last couple of semesters, we've started adding a, a workshop component to this, where, where students come along to, to six weeks of a, a programming skills workshop, where for two hours a week, we just work on establishing some of these um, Python familiarity. Okay, so how have we approached um, Python with these students? So the first thing I've, we've been doing is we had to make some decisions about how to do this uh, technologically. So we've sort of evolved into using uh, Spider as the IDE. So if any of you, you have used Spider, it's quite a good environment. You've got an editor, you've got an output window, you've got a help window, all in the one, one program. So previously we'd have had students use sort of IPython in one window, command prompt in another window, Notepad++ in another window. And it all got very confusing for, for students that weren't all that um, familiar with um, things like the command prompt. So Spide has been really helpful in um, really simplifying the, that process. Second thing is that um, I, I developed some, some websites that has some lessons for, for the students. So I'll go into these in a little bit more detail, but the idea is that it allows students to, to work on, the, on this material both inside and outside class. Associated with these websites is a set of screencasts. So for each lesson, I've got a 10 or to 60 minute uh, screencast where I um, essentially narrate as I'm using Spider to, to implement the same lessons as the students are following along with. One thing that we've been doing that I think is, has proved very useful is this idea of learning logs. So we've been doing this with the internship students. So what that involves is after each lesson, students are required to make a post on Moodle. So Moodle is our course administration platform where they have to um, write a little blog post that says what their goals were going into the session, things that they've found that went well, things that were challenging, and what their goals are for the next session. So I then go and, and read this and I comment on, on their entries. So I think students have found this really useful. That sort of reflection on their, on their learning, I think really, really guides or structures how they approach this material. But as an educator, it's been fantastic. So to know what students are finding challenging in this sort of a way is really, really valuable. And students are much more are willing to write um, things that they're finding challenging as opposed to sort of mention those sorts of things in class. And finally, import Turtle. So this was um, a couple of weeks ago when, or might have been more recent than that, when I was reading sort of obituaries of Seymour Papert and I recalled sort of turtle when I was growing up as being the way that I started learning programming. And I thought, well, I had a, had a lesson later that day and I thought, oh, we'll, we'll try using turtle just to, to see how it goes, just for some nostalgia on my part. But it was amazing how, how well it went. So students really, really like using this sort of turtle. And I think we saw it in a few talks on, on Friday in particular, that this sort of uh, graphical uh, feedback is seeing something tangible that's affected by their code is really important. 
And we've started incorporating turtle into each of our lessons from now on. And I think students really look forward to that turtle component of the lessons. OK, so just to give you a bit of an idea about the, the websites. So the first one was on programming fundamentals. So this covers the sort of um, the basics of, of programming in Python. So the first question to, to think about is, well, well why, why did I go ahead and develop my own material rather than use all the great material that's out there? I think there were, were two main re reasons. Uh, the first is, I'll get onto this a little bit more, is that um, for students, it seems to be really important that they have an application in mind. So it needs to be tied to something concrete with what they're, what they're doing in the rest of their studies. So here I can start introducing some of these fundamental concepts, but tie them back into psychology in some way. So when we're talking about uh, loops, for example, we can tie them into a situation where, say, you've collected data on 100 participants, you have 100 files, you want to process those, a loop is a way you can do that. So it allowed me to sort of keep it tied to applications by developing, developing it myself. And it also allowed, allowed me to really constrain the coverage. So I made a few perhaps sort of controversial choices. So we don't cover things like dictionaries or students don't even write their own custom functions. So I wanted to keep it as, as simple as possible so we could get onto the, the applications. So just to give you a quick look. So here's an example of the website for strings and booleans. And so here's an example where what I also wanted to do was I wrote some, some Python code that would take in um, little snippets of Python that I'd written, execute those when building the website, and include the output in the web page. So this provided me with a lot of um, functionality, but I think it also prevented something that I really wanted to avoid, which is I think there's nothing more demotivating as a learner to be working through some material. You just can't get it to work, and it ends up you can't get it to work because there's a bug in the actual material. So hopefully by actually running it as I'm building it, we could sort of avoid some of those problems. So the next ones are more applied. So here, this is for the vision and brain students. Another website where they uh, learn all about developing a vision science experiment through PsychoPy. It's the same sort of idea. But now here's an example for shapes where they start to learn to draw. So here's a simple visual illusion. This is the Ponzo illusion. And they can see all the code to generate Mondrians and another illusion, a Kanitsa triangle. All these sort of fundamental uh, things that they learn as part of vision science, they can produce those using Python and PsychoPy. And the last one is for, for data analysis and visualization. So this is really mostly for the internship students, where we really go into some detail about using arrays and how we can create figures, use descriptive and inferential statistics to do some of our data analyses. And just as another example, here we uh, use views to sort of uh, build up a scatter plot. So we start with an empty frame draw some dots that are all connected, and then we end up with, it's hopefully a sort of a, a reasonable plot of a correlation. Okay, so how has this been received by, by students? Some of the positive reactions are, it was really, it was interesting to finally know how all those experiments are created on the computers. Python or MATLAB skills are incredibly useful when you are designing psychology experiments and should definitely be taught in other classes. I now know what programming is and what it can potentially do and how it might be used in a research sense. And not surprisingly, given the crowd, I, I found Python great to use. So these are all things that we were hoping to see, this sort of recognition of an understanding of what goes on behind the scenes when producing an experiment. Of course, there were a, a few uh, negative um, uh, reception as well. 
So this is one of the challenges is that it seems a little bit rushed and very difficult to be comfortable enough with Python to be able to create the study in such a short period of time. And along the same theme we had, it was almost like doing a second additional course as I was completely unfamiliar with coding previously. So these are both very reasonable comments. So we do ask a lot of these students. So typically around 75% in my experience are coming in with absolutely no coding experience whatsoever and yet we're asking them to, to learn uh, quite a lot of Python as well as develop their own experiment. And another one was, I'll get onto this a little bit, the ability to set it up at home without a virtual machine would have been very useful. So just to go into these challenges in a little bit more detail. So what I think is the biggest challenge, certainly for me and I think for the students as well, is just the, the time commitment involved. So I, I show students a graph like this when I ask them to sort of take a bit of a leap of faith when learning this material. Because what they've been learning so far are things like Word and Excel and SPSS. So there you can get up and running very quickly. So if you bring up Word, you can very quickly start typing up a document and be on your way. The trouble is though, of course you saturate. So your usefulness becomes, at some point you just reach a, a ceiling where you, it's no longer as useful to you as you hope. And what I argue here with programming is that it takes a while until you can actually do something using your programming skills. So you have to build up these fundamentals before you can actually start applying it to problems that you want to. Of course, then once you reach a certain point, you get an explosion and you end up being able to use, have a, a much higher utility out of this knowledge than you would if you just stuck with using Excel or, or something like that. So also challenges in terms of the technical implementation. So students really want to have this bring your own device uh, capacity. Uh, Windows has been fine here, thanks largely to the WinPython distribution. This has made it really easy. Uh, Linux has been fine, or actually I don't think I've had a student ask to use Linux, but <laughs> I use Linux so it should be fine I think. Um, Mac has proved to really be very troublesome, so I still am yet to find a good solution of how to get all these uh, packages installed on student Macs. So I've tried using things like Conda and it just hasn't, hasn't seemed to work. So I'd be interested if anybody does have any suggestions on that um, front, I'd be very happy to hear them. Uh, Python 2 versus Python 3 causes a few, few issues. Mostly just, to just, it's just another thing that adds to uh, student confusion where they're already a bit uncertain about the whole programming thing. So ideally I would just start, I would just be teaching Python 3 and it wouldn't be a problem, but some of these key packages that I use are, are version 2 only. And this is going to be more of a problem as WinPython um, has ended support for, for version 2. Um, so I think we're going to have to make that move very soon. Uh, just a few challenges in terms of um, educationally implementing this, this material. Uh, so Bruce addressed this a little bit as well, this idea of addressing competency versus addressing engagement. So we don't actually directly assess students on how well they can code. So instead we, we assess how engaged they are with the material or some um, other aspect like the uh, study that they end up producing. Um, I touched on this a little bit, this idea of fundamentals versus applications. So ideally we can get, we need to be able to get to applications of this knowledge as soon as we can, but because of that curve I showed you, it takes a while before you can actually get to that point. So being able to keep students motivated and their interests maintained is an ongoing challenge. In terms of um, the method of instruction, so I'm still um, deciding how, how best to, to implement this material. So I've, as I said, I've got all these screencasts, but I haven't found them to work really all that well. So I think I might need to integrate them into a more, more coherent framework as some sort of a, a flipped classroom method. Okay, just to give you an idea about where I would like to take this in the future, um, I think the best thing is we, if we can start to integrate this material into first and second year courses. So we saw on, on on Friday that for high schools, 
It seemed like the way that they were going to do this was through the maths program. I think for psychology, uh, the best way into first and second year is through statistics. So psychology students learn a lot of statistics, and I think programming fits really well into that, both as a way of learning programming, and I really do think that that helps learn statistics as well. Um, just, we have this period now where um, our graduates don't have much programming knowledge, but in order to, to graduate with something like a PhD from my area or related areas, you really do have to have developed substantial programming uh, knowledge. So we need, might need to start running some postgraduate workshops. And finally, just to sort of on a slightly different topic, I've started looking into some online teaching material and I found the, the Python uh, pa package um, bouquet to be very useful. Just to give you a quick example here, put together a little online tutorial where this is uh, bouquet code running and students can um, do some, some simple interaction to learn a little bit about signal detection theory. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, I think programming really is important for many um, aspects of psychology research. The, the graduates of the undergraduate psychology program really do have extensive knowledge and skills in a variety of things and are exceptionally prepared for a variety of roles. I think if we can add a little bit of computer programming to, um, knowledge to this, it will be a very powerful combination. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you very much, Damien. If anyone has any questions, uh, form your way up to the microphone uh, just to get the ball rolling. Um, the uh, the Pi Psych, uh, Psycho, Psycho Pi, yep. um, is that just like sort of like, like a Pi game for, for psychology? So it's mostly graphics primitives, a little bit of user interface primitives, things like that? Yeah, pretty much. It's a, a wrapper mostly around Piglet now. Historically, it has been Pi game. Uh, so there is a little bit of uh, Pi game support as well. Um, but yeah, it is mostly a wrapper around those sorts of things with some sort of decisions that are um, very useful for vision science. Like instead of color values going from zero to 255, they go from minus one to one, right. just because it's more natural for our sort of sure. things. Yep. Related, um, you said getting, like, getting installed and stuff was a big problem. Have you yep. looked at using like Jupyter Notebooks and things like that as a mechanism? I have had a little bit of a play around with Jupyter Notebooks, yeah. But um, as of yet, I haven't had a whole lot of success and I think one of the real challenges is with this experiment material, often what you're developing is something that has sort of contingencies to them, if you know what I mean. So um, if I'm teaching an experiment, I'll want a window to pop up for, a, for the person to do a few trials and then for the window to close. So implementing that sort of dynamic thing in something like a notebook, I haven't found a good way to do that yet, but it's certainly possible, yeah. Um, I saw the slides of this PyCon talk by Jake Vanderplas called Statistics for Hackers. Don't know if you saw it, but um, it was really appealing in that it made statistics simpler through the use of simple programming concepts by using Monte Carlo methods. Yep. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts on making statistics easier for psychology students while integrating uh, programming. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, I, for me, statistics really clicked when I could actually program it and do some simulations. So, um, look at the um, my data analysis one. Things like um, the descriptive statistics, uh, we do we use techniques like bootstrapping and things like that. Things that are computationally intensive that really give in certainly my impression, a more detailed understanding of what's going on behind the scenes of these statistical tests. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, very nice talk. Um, I'm wondering if there's a case for every science graduate to take an, um, a programming course in the same way that you usually take maths. Uh, do you care to comment on that and how far are we from that if there's a case for that? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. So I think, I, th I certainly think that that would be useful. Um, the question is whether it should be sort of centralized or not. 
So one possibility would be for something like the computer science department to run a, a course for each year where they teach the fundamentals to a whole bunch of science graduates. I think I would probably argue for this sort of approach where um, each department can have bring their own sort of um, um, uh, particular requirements to the table. So I think that's very important. But the general message of all science graduates having some programming knowledge, I definitely agree with. Um, so for the postgraduate case, uh, I was curious as to whether you'd had much to do with the software carpentry community or that side of things. I haven't, no. And I think for much, much the same reason. I've certainly looked at their material and I have taken a few of their ideas for how they run their lessons. Um, but again, I, I found that some of it just wasn't really appropriate for the sort of things that my students need to know. Um, and when I had under such time constraints, I think really has to be um, very tied to applications. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. You've been teaching, uh, you've been teaching undergrads to use PsychoPy to design vision experiments. Have you? Is that informed by people um, using it in anger for for actual um, psychological research? PsychoPy. Um, certainly, yeah, no, I, I use it, it's sort of my day-to-day -day, um, research platform and I think over the last 10 years it's been sort of reported in multiple uh, peer-reviewed publications, um, sort of the background of PsychoPy and also it's been used by many, many studies, so it's certainly not just a teaching tool. I just want to follow up on that comment about um, software carpentry. Uh, do you have the capacity to make your lessons public, perhaps contribute them back to the software carpentry? Because Yeah, well, the, these, the websites are all, all online. Um, the, the material that they come from is in a mercurial repository, um, so it should be all publicly accessible. Yeah, I, yeah, I guess just a question whether into, university yeah. has a policy of, uh, you know, if you were to make them open source or, or CC by Y, for That's a, a good question. I haven't even thought of that. But um, from my perspective, it's certainly open for everybody. So, so yeah, speaking on behalf of the software carpentry yep. community, we'd love to have new lessons. Yep. Um, we'd love to have lessons on specific topics. Um, so you should definitely talk to us about great. maybe yeah, integrating that, your stuff back that in. That sounds great. Thank you. Okay, th thank you very much, uh, Damien. Everyone, please give me a hand. Thank you.